Listen, dear people, the most important thing that you and I have got to understand is there's nothing that exemplifies the life uh, that is in Christ Jesus and the ministry of the Holy Ghost like our families. And, you know, we can come together and we can put on some real happy faces and shout and dance and uh, look good in church. And, you know, that will have a certain degree of an impact. But the reality of it is, if people, people, and people may come to the meeting and say, wow, you know, this, these people are really on fire for God. They're really excited about God. But eventually what's going to happen is they're going to stumble over into your house. They're going to stumble over into your relationship and they're going to find out what it's really like. And unfortunately, too many people are going to get their bubbles popped at that very moment. Because all of a sudden, there's a bunch of screaming and hollering and fussing and fighting and bickering, bickering and everything that should not be going on is going on. And uh, so we're going to deal, deal with that a little bit tonight in the Catch-22. But uh, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that each person in this place will grab a hold of the reality that no place is the glory and the power of God going to be witnessed like in the families. There's absolutely no hope uh, for the future without the family. Uh, a, a viable church is a church that is uh, not only... Um, filled with families, but filled with families that are raising up their kids also to take a place uh, in the household of God as well. And children are not going to take a pl their place in the household of God if they're living in a, in, a, in a home that is far from a sanctuary, a home that is far from a place of serenity, a home that is far from a place of peace, a home that is far from the place of the principles of God. Look, kids get it. Even little kids get it. They can see the difference between mom and dad in church and the way they act around other people and the way that they may be gracious and generous in their interaction with a stranger or gracious and generous and their act interactions with a friend, and then they go home and they see mom and dad fussing and fighting. Mom and dad aren't close friends. Mom and dad aren't loving each other, kissing each other. They're not interacting in a way that is, uh, is befitting of mom and dad. It's, it's like mom uh, interacts better with the, uh, with, the, with the pastor or with the, uh, dad's friend at church than she, than she does with dad. Dad interacts better with uh, some uh, friend uh, or some lady at the church better than uh, uh, she interacts with dad. Wait a minute, what's up here? That brings a whole bunch of insecurity in the house. And it's, and it's high time that we recognize that we are either raising a dysfunctional children that do not know how to lay hold on the power of God, don't know how to live honest and sincere and true lives, or we're raising uh, children that are full of the Holy Ghost, who've been taught well by their, by their families, by their parents, by example. And I pray in the name of Jesus that these series that we are doing here on order in the house, and we're calling everybody to order right now in Jesus' name, calling you to order from this day forward, that you'll recognize that there are divine principles here that aren't just easy to go over on one, just a, one little flash glance in an hour here in a meeting. But you're going to have to go ahead and and you're going to have to give yourself to the study of this. Each one of you could write a book on this. Write your own book, you know. Write the book about what your house is like right now. Write the book about what it's supposed to be like in 10 years. Because I'm telling you right now, if you don't labor for the things that God has uh, granted to us, you're going to go without the blessings and you're going to go without the good things. And all the bad things that you detest, they're not going to go away. Guess what? They're going to get worse. And those people that you said you would never be like, you're going to be just like them. And maybe even worse. Unless you give yourself, absolutely give yourself to the to something that has to do with truth. <laughs> I mean, we, we live in a society that doesn't prioritize properly. We, we prioritize money above everything else. And really, God said, you know, we put our priorities on what we're going to eat and what, where our shelter and our clothing. God says, don't do it, but we do it anyway. And expect it to turn out good. We put priorities on trying to get wealthy and make ourselves rich. And God says, if you do, it's going to be hard for you to enter into the kingdom of God. Self-made men, people who make themselves rich, are going to be thrust through with all kinds of temptation and many darts. And as Job said, uh, the rich are tormented in their sleep at night. But the bottom line of it is, there is a wealth that God will give to us. He'll make us wealthy if we'll obey his will and his word. He said, I'll give you houses that you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant, wells you didn't dig. 
Somebody might sit back and say, well, that ain't fair. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, God says it's fair. So as far as I'm concerned, look, it's fair. He knows better than anybody else on the face of the earth. And the bottom line of it is, is you either learn how to serve people or you learn how to squash them. You either learn how to lay down your life or step on their head. And so you get to understand you're going to learn that at home. Okay. What you really are is going to come out when you got your hair down and you're sitting relaxed in your posture where everything is according to the way you have planned it or according to the way that, uh, you know, you have, uh, of exposing really what's, what's, what's making you tick. What's uh, the emotional state of, of your own personality. And we pray that that emotional state of your own personality is one of self-rule, uh, domination over yourself. And if you read my daily bread today, you know, I quoted a verse of scripture where Paul was ministering to Felix and he was talking to Felix of righteousness and uh, a word that we usually call temperance or really which means self-rule or domination over self and of judgment that is at uh, right at hand and of course Felix trembled but you know there's something very important to us of understanding dominion over self and learning how to deny ourselves and making sure that we're on a we're on a road to, to maturity emotional maturity and psychological to maturity. Instead of just putting all that on hold and just because we've grown and we got a full, you know, the full body suit, full, uh, full grown human body suit, we think that, well, we got it all. And we, at that age, you know, we got, you know, once you hit 18 or 21, depending upon the rules of your particular state, you know, you think you're an adult. Look, you're not an adult. A baby is 100 years old. I mean, come on. You know, that's, that's how Isaiah put it concerning what, you know, the way that God's going to grant uh, longevity. Uh, to uh, to those uh, who live in the the reign of Jesus, but I I really pray that you guys will recognize squabbling and fussing and fighting and all these things that go on in the house that shouldn't be. Look, I'm gonna tell you right now. Somebody pointed out to me the other day, or just recently, in fact, in fact, it was today that they even noticed when people's lives aren't right, their dogs are messed up, huh? Our dogs are all weird. I tell you right now, when you messed up, your kids all messed up. It ain't your kids' fault. You're beating your kids upside the head for something you imposing on them spiritually. Because if you're because if you're out of you're not you're not right. Okay, you're out of balance. Just be, people make a big deal when their body's out of balance, and, and they should. But I'm gonna tell you right now, you ought to make even a bigger deal when your spirit's out of balance. And you're screaming and hollering and emotionally upset and wound up tighter than a clock. Huh? Dear people, these things cannot be. You're going to have to learn to come over into a realm where God's grace is, is, is that place that you've decided to, to, to live in. And that's the topic tonight. The topic tonight is serving one another in love. And there's absolutely no way that you're going to serve one another. It's a pipe dream. <laughs> Look, you're not going to serve one another in love unless you're receiving the source and provision of love that was provided to us uh, by this relationship that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to be going over tonight. Really, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to really be dealing with you on the, on the facts of how your house is going to be a sanctuary and how your kids can be right. Because ultimately, this series of Order in the House will culminate into the last session on raising godly children. Seeing your seed become mighty in the earth. And I, I pray in the name of Jesus that you realize that ain't going to happen just because you feed them, give them clothes, and send them off to school, and buy them some Christmas presents, and give them some toys. It ain't, ain't going to happen that way. It's going to happen because there's godly principles established. They are the pillars of your existence. You put God first. You put the ways of the kingdom first. You put divine principles. You hold them up as high as they possibly can be. Men, as we've said in the first session, you are the leader of your home. And you, but if you're going to be an a, appropriate leader, you have to be led. <laughs> because you don't have the, 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 the authority unless you're being led by Christ Jesus. And, unless, and you understand that Christ Jesus has authorities that are representing him, which he's placed in the church. Your whole family's going to be messed up just because you can't. You're too high-minded, too egocentric, too self-centered. You recognize you've got to come under the rule of the church. And the authority of the church is described plainly in the New Testament. And then it just flows on down out of kilter from there. Huh? And then if the you, you, women, if you're not willing to follow, if you're not willing to honor your husband, if you're not willing to understand your roles and responsibilities in that leadership, then once again, even if your husband's doing everything right and he is a man who's walking in righteousness and godliness and worthy of double honor, still, because you're not willing, you're, con, you, you're revolting in the house, 
Okay, you're creating a dissension in the house. Once again, everything spun out of order. But oh my, what happens when uh, a man and a woman uh, begin to love one another and the basis of that love is a friendship, a friendship that is nurtured every day. Now, uh, too much romance and too many romantic concepts of marriage to where that the basis of friendship is somewhat neglected. I, I guarantee you that if you look up um, the definition of friendship and befriending, uh, the uh, romantic side of it will not be included in it. But we can understand this. A true friend loveth at all times. And, and, and that's, uh, uh, that is absolutely a fundamental building block of your life. And, and we're going to go over that a little bit here tonight, too. And you're going to have to mentor that. You're going to have to recognize that we take each other for granted. We start looking at each, we start looking at our wives as our mother and our husbands as our daddy. And all that stuff is going to have to end. We have to put ex- unrealistic expectations on one another. Look. God has made us sojourners. He's made us heirs together of the grace of life. He's given us our dearest friend and confidant, one that we can confide in. And you say, well, my husband's opposite opposite from me. And that is really good because he's going to bring that missing piece into your life. Or my wife, she's opposite from me. Well, that's really good because you're going to discover you're not, you're not complete all by yourself. Huh? You're going to have to, under, you're going to, have to understand that you're not an, uh, 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 a deity, unto yourself or even an entity as it were unto yourself but you are made up uh, praise the name of the living God of a family that dates back unto the time of Adam and Eve and uh, praise the name of the living God father is the one who gave them life so our whole identity and our whole life dates back to the life that is in God. He sustains us and keeps us. And if we can understand the sacredness of it and the preciousness of it, then we're going to reverence the process. We're going to be more aware of the process. We're not going to be all carried away with wrong priorities where we go to work for 20 hours out of a day. Huh? And don't think that it's not true because I got stuck in that trap too. I got stuck in that trap of, of going to work and being at work for eight hours, then coming to the church and being in the church for two to three hours, and then going home and sitting down and facing a computer and writing a book for another three, four hours, and finally get to bed at one o'clock in the morning and write pretty much one, little maybe a little after, and then getting up six o'clock in the morning, 6.30 in the morning, doing it all over again, in day in, day out. My kids running around, they, they, they grew up. But they grew up, fortunately, they grew up under the principles of the Holy Ghost and a mother who knew exactly what she was doing, even when dad didn't. And so, you know, women, you must understand that women has, don't have a second rate place. They are the moral fiber of a society. If a woman doesn't walk in morality, her whole house is ruined. Because she is the moral strength and the moral fiber. She's the one supposed to look at the daughters and say, look, a little more length than that dress, dear. Hey, wait a minute. The, you, the cut's a little too low. Get it up. She's the one who produces virtue in her children, who produces a self-consciousness concerning her manner and her behavior and her appearance and, her, and the way she handles herself and carries herself. Women, you got to understand, you carry a vital role that goes way beyond. I mean, I'll tell you right now, if it hadn't been for my wife, I would have told Totally ruined my daughters. I did not know how to ra- raise my daughters. I barely knew how to raise my sons. It was all the grace of God. I just w- referred to the various different scriptural references on what to do to do with my boys. Okay, and my girls. I-, I-, I would start to correct them, and and I would correct them wrong. I, I just didn't even understand what I was doing. And Ann would say to me, she said, "No, honey, you got to be careful. You got to say a little bit softer. You got to do a little bit more gentle." Because I didn't, you know, I didn't understand. You know, I just saying one thing, and all of a sudden I crush them. Did not realize how valuable the father figure is to the daughter. And, uh, but mama was real sensitive to that. And so she was, as I was describing to you last week, she was the executive coach. And, um, and I tell you, women have to step up and realize that they've got to speak up. And if a guy says, look, you're, you're usurping my authority, well, then you're an idiot. Okay, you need to wait a minute. Usurping authority is where she comes in, punches you upside the jaw and tells you to forget what you're saying. You don't know nothing you're talking about. Come in and behind your, I mean, and of course, I'm swinging the pendulum a little bit there. But uh, the, the reality of it is, is, is having a confidant, having someone that says, listen, let's think about this a little bit more. Understand, girls are more sensitive. Understand, your approval or disapproval is the universe to them. I mean, the guys just kind of like, they just flow with it. But when you 
say it to the daughter, she's looking at you for every bit of her self-worth. And if you see, if you look at her in a, in a wrong way, she starts crying. And, you know, and it's like, why is she crying now? I haven't done nothing yet. And so we have a lot to bring to the whole equation. If we learn how to walk in a, a proper divine order and a proper uh, state of, of humility towards one another. And uh, so hopefully as we talk about serving one another in love, you understand that there are thousands of things that fall out of this. There's no way I could even begin to touch on them tonight. I mean, you know, I've gotten all these handouts down to three pages. I mean, the first, on the first night out, I had about a five or six page handout and I knew I had more things I could possibly cover in an entire night. If we went from like what, seven o'clock till seven in the morning. And I was, I mean, I was all tied up and not saying how in the world am I going to ever lay this thing out? It's too big. So, I mean, if, when we do this again, I'm going to have to do eight sessions so that I can devote two to uh, leadership, roles, and responsibilities. Because I still don't feel like that I laid the proper kind of foundation there that really it's deserving of. But by the help and the grace of God, we'll keep undergirding it. And then, you know, you write a book this year and then go ahead and write a book in five years from now. And then go ahead and write a book 15 years from now and then write one 50 years from now. Man, I'm telling you right now, they've become a treasure to the church. Because if somebody got together and started gleaning all that information, because you really did apply it. You know, you went home and, you know, like Randy did and practiced all the various different uh, uh, leadership styles with his wife. Said, here's a strong leadership. And then, you know... He, and he's more of a, you know, basically passive leader, right? And then Terry really fell in love with a strong leader. Wow. It all happened all over again. Look, I like that one. Let's practice this, okay? So and then really taking it to heart and understanding that the, if, the only way you're going to understand the mechanism of it is you're going to have to get in there and handle it. I mean, it's not just going to happen by diffusion. I mean, nothing grows on its own but weeds, and nobody wants them. Nothing grows on its own but bad stuff. There ain't nothing that's fruit on it that's tasty, that's good for your health is going to grow on its own. It's all going to grow through effort and labor and commitment. And God commands us to do so. He commands us to seek after knowledge, to labor for wisdom and insight more than we would labor for anything on the, on the earth. And more than we would labor for gold or riches or, or fine jewelry or precious things. He says, go after wisdom and knowledge and instruction. Receive it. Okay, and so that's what we're here doing tonight. We're giving you wisdom and knowledge and instruction by the Holy Ghost. And, and so here we go. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And I'm telling you, you get to grab a hold of that first John 4, 11. And we, you know, it's too sad that we see so many people taking the principles of the word of God and practicing in every place but in their house, okay? They go out and they win the, win the loss and, oh man, they're so tender and patient with everybody else, but then they come home screaming and hollering, demanding and fussing and fighting, okay? And listen, it just got it. We just have to realize that that's upside down. God didn't create your wife to take all of your nonsense. He didn't create your husband to put up with all of that you know, childish behavior. God in heaven help us. In Jesus' name, everybody said yes. yes. Amen. Lord, because we look into you, we know, oh God, we can't change ourselves. Leper can't change his spots. Ethiopian, the color of his skin. But the Lord God will come and he'll make us right. He, if we put our heart into this, he'll make us right. We'll get to discover what other people have neglected to pursue. Uh, you just, look, your dad isn't the model of it. Your granddad isn't the model of it. Your great-grandfather isn't the model of it. The model of it is, is the Word of God. The model of it is laid out for us in the, in the Word. And it's like sometime, at some point, we and our families are going to rise and we're going to be the light of the world. We're going to be the example. We're going to be the envy of the nations that we ought to be. Man, when you're walking with God and walking in divine principles and the glory of God is in your life, you're the envy of the nations. That was the only way that Israel would ever become the envy of the nations. Because the power and the glory of God is there. And everything about their life is, 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 is blessed. And so when the queen of Sheba comes and beholds uh, Israel in the time of Solomon walking under the most mantle of God, the blessing of God, <laughs> she fainted because of the glory of the thing. That's the way our houses have got to be. And that gun, it's not going to happen on its own. It's go you're going to be dedicated to divine principles. And so what I have here is I have the most important divine principle is the principle of love. I told you before, you know, we're talking about give, giving ourselves, devoting ourselves to making one another happy. I mean, that is, whoa, 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 how, 
What more could you possibly want in life than to have someone devoted to making you happy and you're being devoted to making someone happy and that's reciprocal. What a blessed life to just simply be happy. But it's a fantasy. It is a pipe dream. It has no basis in reality unless the divine principles of God are established in your life. Number one, the divine principles of God is leadership, roles and responsibility, willing to recognize authority, willing to be that take your role in that authority that God has assigned you and look to him for the ability to perform it and to do it okay but above all other things you've got to understand the principle of divine love so we know in the love of christ and our relationship we know that if 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 we have the if, if we're dwelling in the love of christ we, we got the fullness of god there and uh, that's first point we know that if we're dwelling in love in our relationship god's dwelling there and uh, so we have, uh, we have an understanding that, that we're, we're going to have to look to the right source of love. And if we're looking to ourselves for love, we're making a terrible mistake. You know, if we're looking for the touchy-feely good uh, uh, responses, you know, you, you want something good out of me, you're going to have to push the right button, buddy. Huh? That, that, that isn't what's going down here because God's given us a love to love our enemies. He's given us a love that will love um, those who uh, hate us. He's given us a love to love the world, lay down our life for the world. He's given us a love to love the brethren. Reckon he's given us a love to love our spouse, to love our husband, or love our wife? Of course he has. You think that that's more important to him than anything else? Absolutely it is. Uh, listen, men, what you're going to be called into above all other things uh, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ is how well you love your wife. He's going to examine and that is going to be the basis of it. About living and dwelling in God and staying in his fullness, you can sit around and be just so hungry and desperate and so, you know, just howling at the top of your lungs when you come to the meeting, believing God to come down in all of his glory. But he's looking at you going, hey, look, I saw what you, I saw what you did to your wife on the way here. I, I saw how you treat your husband on the way here. You're going, you're going to get the first things right. God, look, people say that Christianity is a crutch, a bunch of escapists. No, 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 no. You must understand, God demands that we face the reality of everything. There is no shortcuts with God. You don't go forward until you pass the first lesson. It's just the way it is. And if, and if you don't, if you're not willing to move forward and you're not willing to pass, God take you around and around and around the wilderness and the desert and humble you until you're ready to come cross over and obey him and, and do the things which are right. But there's no, there's no skipping grades with God. God doesn't, God doesn't skip grades. He doesn't say, well, I'll look, they've been hanging out for 30 years. Go ahead and promote them. It just isn't, isn't the way it is. It's simply whether or not you're going to walk in obedience. So I want you to grab a hold of the fact that here, if we're going to serve one another in love, and we're serving one another in love on the basis of all these scriptures that we read about, hey, we know that we pass from death into life because we love the brethren. Look, you know you pass from death into life because you love your husband. Okay, you know you pass from death into life because you love your wife. <laughs> and that we're not talking about just any kind of love. We're not talking about the kind of love that says you take whatever kind of stuff I'm dishing out and don't you complain. Huh? Well, we're not talking about that kind of love. <laughs> we're talking about the love, that nurturing, affectionate love, that love that lays down his life, that love of kindness, that love of grace, that love that loves us more than we love ourselves kind of love, the love that only comes from God. Now, in understanding that then, you're not going to look to yourself for the provision of that love, but you're going to ask the Holy Spirit who comes and pours that love into us. It is, an, it is a work of God's divine grace uh, where that love of God flows out of us that causes us to be and uh, behave ourselves with the nature of Father's love. That's the only love that's going to be of value, okay? Hey, look, it's not a Christmas present, you know, once a year. It's not a birthday present, you know. It's not a, you know, uh, a, a date night once a year. That's not what's going to make the difference. Even if you had a date night every night, that ain't going to make the difference. All that is is just a bigger expense that you have in your household. You know, when it really comes down to it, the, the, what's going to make the difference is love, a purity of love, a, a generosity of love, a, a, a loving to lay down by your wife at night or lay down by your husband at night and go to sleep, a, a unwillingness to, their, to allow any kind of division or strife or envy or riff of any kind in your relationship. You don't go to bed tonight, at night unless you said, look, if I've done anything wrong, wrong, please forgive me. And then if she wants to go ahead and point out exactly what 
what you did wrong well then go ahead and listen and say well i'm sorry on that one too and that one and, and don't become impatient because you're the one who opened up the conversation anyways and and you should listen and and <laughs> not be well what happens as soon as somebody tries to start making some headway then we get all defensive and say i didn't do it you did it, it was because the reason i did that's because what you did huh and then all that is is that's that sibling rivalry that's uh, that rather you know that's that yeah, squabbling siblings and, and uh, spousal rivalry, which we're going to get to in a little bit. We don't want that. That ain't no light into the world. The kids are enduring. They're like, they're thinking, they're, they're three years old thinking, oh, I mean, they're counting how long is it going to take them to be 18 years old. And it's, it's, it's beyond their math skills, but they're thinking, man, I can't wait till I leave home. And, of course, they don't put in that vernacular because they just sit there in their little beds and then they grieve in their hearts. And that's true a child abuse. They just sit there and they grieve in their little hearts because they think it's somehow their fault that mama's screaming at dad and dad's screaming back at mama. That's just the way it is, people. You must understand that you're a, a yells from hell, so shout to the Lord, and that that hell never produces or begets heaven. Never. Hell, that which comes out of hell, that which comes out of the demonic realm, has an adverse effect spiritually on your entire household. So don't allow it. Don't go in there and, and take that frying pan and hit your kid upside the head with it. Huh? Don't go in there and take that match and light his little feet on fire. Let's stop doing that stuff. And, and you know, somebody said, well, I'd never do that. Well, yeah, no, you wouldn't do that. Not in a physical sense, but what are you doing spiritually? You've got to understand that the spiritual impacts that we have on our children have more profound effect than any physical deformity we may inflict upon them. And nobody in this place would inflict a physical deformity upon their child through some kind of correction. Huh? No way. So watch out what you're doing. Understand that there is always, there is always seeds you're planting and there's always a harvest you're going to get. And if you sow to the flesh, it's going to reap corruption in your life. It's going to reap a whirlwind of hell in your family. But if you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life. Your children will grow up to be pillars. They'll be strong. They'll be fortified. They'll be well suited. They'll be able to, to become those uh, leaders in society that they're supposed to be. Now, come on now. These things are absolutely important. If your children are already uh, too old, there's nobody in here like that. Maybe David, you can help out your grandchildren. You know, you can help out your your children and as they raise their children. And and then if God blesses you with you with with even more years, your great grandchildren. You could be an overseer. You can be a leader in the home. You can no longer uh, lay back with some kind of passive or accommodating leadership style or some kind of style uh, that uh, is just consensus driven or facilitator style. You understand? Wait a minute. I have a responsibility to God and to my house, and I'm not going to stand back and just watch something go down that isn't right I'm going to but I'm going to also give correction in the right manner okay um, bring the son or the, or the grandson off to the side and say come here I want to talk to you I love you so much and I'm going to pour in uh, the kind of information the kind of divine principles and skills that is going to make the difference in their household and in their families praise the name of Jesus <laughs> and eventually we'll get it right and, and then before long and once we get it right then we're going to be able to help our children get it right and once you know they've got it right then my goodness where is it going to go on from there well it's going to go on from there shining brighter and brighter with the glory of god it's going to go on into perfection i mean you know forget about perfection when the foundation is completely wrong got to tear that thing up and lay a right foundation for many generations and families it's been all a wrong foundation and so basically there's been emulating and repeating and imitating a wrong foundation generation after generation because it isn't the foundation of the family that God laid so we're going to demolish that thing we're going to lay a right foundation then our children are instructed under a right foundation and then they get to go off that foundation under perfection and now we're seeing a seed that has raised up a godly uh, ch- uh, heritage of godly uh, generations coming forth on the earth that are doing it right they're doing it godly God's way. That's what's right. My way's not right and your way's not right. God's way's right. And if you can't get anything else out of tonight, just understand my way and your way are not right. God's way is right. And the issue is about you and I getting enough sense, enough understanding and enough sensitivity to the word of God and the spirit of God to recognize what his right way is. Okay. Oh, that makes sense to you. So our leadership style is servitude. Say servitude. <laughs> 
So it doesn't matter if you're a strong leader, a consensus leader, or a passive leader. The bottom line of it is you better be a leader. You better get your voice heard. You better understand how to become more assertive if you're passive. You got to understand how you got to become more responsible if you're passive. You got to understand how to be more assertive and responsible if you're consensus to recognize. uh, Look, a consensus leader and a passive leader, at the end of the day, they have the responsibility, no matter what style of leadership that they are, that they are promoting or that they are um, um, participating in that at the end of the day, after all is said and done, they are the ones who are going to write the conclusion. And they're the ones who are going to uh, give out the job assignments as you were and write the, uh, the task and the agenda. And, and then they got to be assertive with that. You've got to manage that. You've got to mentor that. You've got to follow up on that. Don't happen by yourself. Somebody said, I can't believe it. God, tell my child, go in and make their bed every day. My goodness gracious, you ought to be in my position looking at you. You ought to be God's position looking at you. What does your boss at work say about you? Look, it's, it's management. And if you don't like management, you just don't like leadership. Leadership demands management. It demands follow-up. It demands continually being responsible and accountable for the direction that's been given. You don't just give somebody direction and abdicate and think that they're supposed to do it all on their own. Is that the way it works, husbands? You go in there and you participate in the direction that you give. You manage it. You nurture it. You empower it. You equip it. You follow up on it. My goodness, now guess what you're going to be? You're going to be a successful leader. You're the kind of leader that will make a company successful. You're now the kind of leader also that make your household successful. I hope you get that. I mean, those are good business principles right there. I hope you get that. I hope you understand that that's the only way. I mean, Joshua's teeth are so white. Let me pick on my son here tonight because his mom is such a follow-up on, did you brush your teeth? I mean, and it doesn't matter. You can hear it. It's like you think, well, you think mom could just go ahead and put that on a tape recorder. No, she is just an effective manager on making sure certain things are done. Uh-huh. And she evaluates. She examines, okay? And if it wouldn't it pass her test, it was back to the bathroom with the toothbrush. Praise God for good management. Look at this fruit. It, it yields. You, you can't weary in well-doing. You can't think that that's just not right, that you have to do that. People, that's what it's all about. You're vesting your life in others. You're serving them. You're, 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 you're doing the things that are for their best interest, okay? And you're doing it in a way that is not controlling and not manipulating, but it's a way that is done in loving and caringness to where that ultimately they might not understand at the moment, but they're going to look back and say, look at all the investment of their life, the love, the care, the concern. My, that is going to result in something that is beautiful and wonderful. That is going to be a well-tended garden. Praise the name of Jesus. And that's what we're, that's what this is all about. So our servitude now, our servitude leadership is a relational servitude leadership. People, you don't really, if I wanted to take on the task of defining that, I, once again, I would have, that would be all tied up in knots up here. So awkward. I would have too many pages to even be able to figure out where in the world I was at. Because really the Bible, the word of God from Genesis to Revelation chapter 22 is really devoted to that style of leadership because that's who God is. He chose the best style of leadership that is out there. The kingdom of God is a relational leadership. It is a relational government. <laughs> That's the kind of government we want in our house. That's the kind of government we want in the church. That's the kind of government we want to have with our children. (laughs) And so I pray in the name of Jesus that you recognize that you're instilling those things into your children by the way that you are, the way that you're interacting and the way that you're disciplining. So it's a leadership style of servitude. And uh, it, that servitude style, that servitude is a relational, a relationship servitude. And the model of it is the Lord Jesus. He came and showed us all the fullness of the Father, said the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. So the greatest ruler is the servant of everyone. Got that now? Now, look, people, I, I, I've got a caution note on the second page. I'm going to turn it to it right now on the second page. Caution. Make sure that you are not the spouse who continually reminds the other spouse that they should be the servant. This is indicative of wanting to be served instead of serving. In fact, this is giving place to sedition and revolt in your own household. And that's not going to produce nothing good. I mean, because the seeds of revolt and the seeds of sedition are going to produce the uh, crop and fruit 
of revolt and sedition. The only correct balance is when both are serving rather than one person being a giver and the other a receiver. Amen. That's why, we, that's why the Lord's constantly talking to us about giving. It's much more blessed to give than it is to receive. Because he, God emphasizes servitude. That is the realm of the kingdom of God. We weren't raised in that. We were raised in an absolute dictatorship. We were raised, were raised in the realm of the strong survive. It's an evolutionary model that the weak are supposed to perish. Huh? The only the strong survive and the strong get stronger. Look, God is not into natural selection. Huh? God didn't invent evolution. Are you with me? Somebody said, well, if you're really going to be a Christian, you need to believe in evolution so that you don't become a mockery among, you know, the, the intellectuals of the world. Let me just tell you something right now. We look like, like, we look like what we look like because this is what God looks like. Because we created in his image and his likeness. He didn't have to discover himself through evolution. Praise God forevermore. He had his likeness and he had his image and he gave that to us. That's one of the gifts that we have. And when we look on man, we don't look at the process of evolution <laughs> and, and, and the splendid results in which it has ultimately produced. We, but we look at the very glory and person of the Almighty. It's beautiful, isn't it? Praise God for it. Now, I'm going to hit on a very touchy subject here. I'm here tonight. I've been talking a lot about the roles and responsibility of leadership. Now I'm going to start talking about roles and responsibility of a follower. Uh-oh. <laughs> no one wants to hear about the roles and responsibility of a follower. But every good leader is a good follower. Uh, you know, Jesus was a good follower. He followed the lead of the Father. He didn't do anything unless Father said it. Wow. What submission. My goodness. What humility. My goodness. What meekness. He didn't see, didn't make a move unless he saw the Father do it. And that is why he was such a profound leader. And so even us, even the men of the, uh, of the church, they have to understand, my goodness, if they're going to be good leader at home, they're going to have to learn how to be a good follower at the church. If they're going to, you know, fault, fine, criticize, be critical, be suspicious, guess what? That is a spiritual thing that will perpetuate itself. It will absolutely multiply in your household and produce the same kind of sentiment in your wife and in your children and in your friends and in your neighbors and everybody around you. It's just going to reproduce itself. You don't want that because we we. We have to recognize it's spiritual, spiritual things that we give place to hang on us and they shout out a voice that is an unheard voice that can only be realized by the thought and the mind and it produces the same effect in others that it has on us. We don't want that stuff. My goodness, dear people, it's worse than a skunk smell. If you had a skunk smell on yourself, you go find out what you need to do to take care of that skunk smell. And if that meant washing in tomato juice, you go get you a bunch of cans of tomato juice and you'd fill up the bath tub with it what a mess and if it meant vinegar or whatever okay listen dear people you don't want to walk around smelling like a skunk in the spirit you don't want to be going off you know going around shouting out these things in the in the spirit okay recognize that what you give yourself to those things that you uh, occupy yourself with those thoughts that you occupy yourself that disposition that you yield to that thing that motivates you and inspires you is also reproducing itself through you for good or for bad. Okay? So, now, that's the intro into the follower, following, uh, following his servant. What makes a good follower? Obedience. My goodness gracious, you have to bring that one up. If your husband is a righteous and godly man who serves the Lord faithfully, then a wife should, with reverence, give him double honor. Okay, and I, and I just pulled that from 1 Timothy 5, 17, and it's really talking about the elders. If, the elders, if there's elders in the church and they rule well, then they're deserving of double honor. I mean, if they're not people who are taking advantage of you and leading you in a wrong way and preaching false doctrines to you, my goodness, all the more should you give them all their honor, all the more should you give them reverence. All the more should you listen to what they've got to say. And so that does indeed apply to your husbands. Recognize that the rest of the world is watching how you respond to your husband, wife. Recognize it. How well you show love in the context of love. Likewise, you wise be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, they may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. First Peter 3, 1. And then faith, faithfulness is one 
of the chief attributes of God. And those who will follow him and please him must be willing to do the same. Consistency is a blessing to all those who touch or are touched by it. The instability of being double-minded is ruinous to everyone who is infected by it. Thankfulness. Just look at just, just quali- these qualities. Obedience, faithfulness, thankfulness. This quality is so important to God that he says, this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus and all things you give thanks. Listen, dear, dear, dear ladies, you're going to have to recognize that when it comes to laying down your life, you say, you first. And that's what we're getting ready to get into, the catch 22. You first. No, 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 it can be you first. Because the fact of it is, yeah, a husband must lay down his wife for his life. Lay down his life for his wife. Wife, life, life, wife. Okay, kind of pretty much a synonym anyways. But nonetheless, a husband must lay down his life for his wife. But not at the expense of abdicating strong leadership. Correct leadership. Godly leadership. Okay? Of making the decision. No, we're walking this way. This is the way we're going. And responsibility in reality falls more heavily on the follower than the leader. Huh? Because the follower, look, you have to lay down your life. It just, there's no alternative. It's just absolutely no alternative. At the end of the day, listen, if you're going to go up and worship God, guess who offers the offering for you? Your husband. And, but God says to the husband, make sure that you dwell with your wife according to knowledge, because if you don't, if you don't dwell with her according to knowledge as heirs together of the gate, heirs together of the grace of life, then your prayers are going to be hindered. God said, listen, I, you guys go and settle it and you guys get it right. Then come back, see me. Huh? Because reality of it is father is not taking any false pretense. And if the beauty and the splendor of those things of, of his divine love, if they not resident in our life, they're just going to hold us back. So listen, women, understand, murmuring and complaining, on the other hand, is the worst offense, and it carries severe punishment by the Lord. And I gave you, like 1 Corinthians 10, 10, don't don't murmur as those who complain. Don't be a complainer as those who complain was destroyed of the destroyer, okay? Look, just, just understand that really your children are going to imitate you. They're going to imitate you uh, and do what you do to all authorities, not just to the husband, not to just the mom. Your response to your husband is not just going to impact how your children are going to treat dad. Your response to your husband is going to impact how your children t- treat the school teacher, how the, your children treat uh, the police, how they treat their boss, how they're going to treat every person in authority for the rest of their life. Of whether they're going to be someone who's submissive or seditious. Oh, we don't want to put their disagreements down into that level of sedition. But it is sedition. Huh? When you say, no, I'm not doing that. You don't know what you're talking about. You're rebellious. It's a revolt. And we know what God says about sedition. We know what God says about rebellion. We know what God says about those kinds of dissensions. We know what God says about those kinds of, of, of arguments. He simply says, there's just no place for that in the kingdom of God. So once again, dear folks, we've got to learn how to serve Jesus Christ in our home. <laughs> we've got to learn how to obey God and the rules of the, of the word of the Lord in the very context of our re- most intimate and most well-defined and most highly uh, accountable and responsible relationship that we have with our husband, with our wife, and with our children. And, and women, you absolutely have the role of being the follower. You got that. You absolutely have the role of being the follower. A man, a man has the absolute role of being a follower too in his context. And, and you're going to have to, women, there's women going to have to remind their husbands, look, you need, you need to get under submission too, big boy. But you had to say it in the right way. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and help them understand that there is an authority all the way down. Father is the head of Christ. <laughs> Even Jesus Christ follows someone. He is under the authority of someone, the father. You, my husband, you say to the, well, the wife, says, you must be under authority too. Of course, you're going to help him do it because obviously you're not going to be, you know, create, you know, you don't want to, whatever you want to do, you don't want to push the button of the male ego. Huh? Whatever you do. So you're going to have to gently lead them. Amen. You're going to have to manage as a, as a follower. Obedience. Obedience, faithfulness, and thankfulness. 
Listen, I hope you can underline that. Obedience. Don't just pass that up real quickly. Obedience. To obey. To obey? Obey? Verse <laughs> wanted me to tell wanted me to marry him one time. They said, We want I want you to leave out that uh, to obey. I said, You don't want me to marry you. Because I'm not gonna leave out what God commands. Uh, no, I want you to leave out the obey part. I want you to leave out the submit part. Huh? Because we're here on equal basis. No, you're not here on equal basis. You're heirs together of the grace of life on equal basis. In the realms of the anointing, the ways, the realms of what, how God receives us, there's neither male nor female. Isn't that glorious? But in terms of the principles of how you're going to raise your family and who's responsible at the end of the day to lead and who's responsible at the end of the day to follow, that is clearly defined. And to circumvent that is to absolutely defy the word of God and to mess up on the foundation which Christ Jesus has laid and ultimately lose out on having all the blessings that God has promised for you to have. I mean, people want to, quote, raise up a child and the way it should go. And they talk about the paddle and they talk about paddle versus his belt. And all. People, that isn't going to impact your kids as much as the way that you and your husband interact with each other. Raising up a child in the way it should go is to be the leader that they can follow even as Jesus was the leader that we can follow even as the minister like Paul is the leader that we can follow as he follows Christ. That is going to have a far, what you do, your behavior, your manner, your action, the things that you feel strong about, the things that you're passionate about are literally being written on the tables of your children's psyche and their emotions. They act like you. They're going to imitate you. They're going to act just like you. You don't like how your children act? Come talk to me about it. They're just a reflection of you. That's all there is to it. it. That goes over like a lead balloon. I can tell you right now, I can, I can feel the dander. I mean, it's like, it's, I can almost feel, almost spiritually feel people's hair rising up on the back of their neck. I never forget the first time the Lord gave me that sensation. I, I didn't know what it was. And, and, uh, and the Lord caused me to realize that that was people's response to the word when they became aggravated or angry at what was being said. Or, you know, it's pretty intense that, that, reality of it is is when we become sensitive to the realms of the spirit we can actually be affected by every state of attitude every state of spiritual behavior and response that exists in man it's true some people can only recognize it on the on the most negative sense especially in the realms of that which is provocative. And that's why commercials use it because they can use imagery and they can use certain gestures and they can use just certain behavior, which is something far more than just a physical demeanor, demeanor to promote through immoral practice or immoral ways their product. Huh? Because you're affected by it. They're, they are a spiritual giant to, pr- to produce that lust. And, you know, some of you walk by and it just, there's just a lust all over. You go, where's that lust coming from? That ain't me, you know. Are you with me? You understand that? And you recognize. And I, I, it, it took me a while to realize that that's part of the way that the Lord gives us spiritual discernment. But if, we're, if we have a propensity to just be captivated by that, then we're carried away by some evil spirit. and don't even, We're not letting spiritual discernment have a, have, a, have a work of grace in our life. We don't understand. Oh, God's showing me the problem there so I can help deal with it. First of all, I can bind it in the name of Jesus so it has no effect. I can stop its work against someone else. And I praise God, I got, had enough sense one day to, have, to be able to have my eyes open. I said, ah, oh, well, I could see the spirit of lust. I saw the spirit of lust because you can literally even feel it, the sensation of it. Most of you probably know what I'm talking about. And so then I could recognize, oh, and I see that spirit of lust going right over there to uh, that person over there. <laughs> so I bound the power of it, bound the effect of it. And now I'm able to be a good watchman, be able to get in there and, and just subtly talk about things and, uh, and, and barriers and, and, and things uh, of that manner. But listen, even on every level, our attitude, our disposition, our response. And, and husbands, you understand this. Men, you have to understand this. Your response to the preacher, your response to the sermon, your response to the authority, your response to the Holy Ghost has, if you respond negatively, if you oppose God, it goes to your whole family, ass aching. 
It goes to your whole family. Your whole family is contaminated by it. Your whole house is contaminated by it. They come under the same influence and they begin to behave themselves in the same way. A critical father has critical children. Are you with me? Do you understand that? Have you ever observed that? Oh, don't you give yourself to that stuff. That's immoral. Huh? So, and, 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 and then hold up. What if the husband's got it right, but the, the wife has got it all wrong? She's all fouled up in her spirit. Look, it goes right to the children because there is a bond. There's a nurturing bond. Allie was explaining some of this to me before we left the house. There's a nurturing bond that goes on between, you know, even that in those first few moments between mama and baby. And uh, that obviously dad just not going to be involved in because he's just, he's not there in that dynamic at that moment in time as a, as newborn baby is laid there upon mama, mama cuddles it and takes care of it. And there's the bonding things that's going on, even it's on a chemical basis as the baby's being born. Come on, huh? And so understand husbands, you've got a good reason to make sure that your household is under divine order because it ultimately is going to have a tremendous impact upon your, uh, Upon your children. Somebody said, well, I, I, you know what? I reason I have a, I have a, uh, a happy marriage and, and, our, and, our, and our home has, has relatively, you know, pretty, you know, uh, good peace. It's because I just go along with whatever she says. She's always right. You spineless. <laughs> you abdicator. Oh, no, I'm just trying to make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's twisting the word of God right there. That's out of context. You cannot make peace and abdicate leadership and be right. Are you with me? You, have, you are a leader and you say, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. You don't ever worry. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. I forgive you. Forgive you. Forgive you. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. Empower you. Empower you. Empower you. That's what's going on between our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And us individually. People, what I want to just emphasize to you in every one of these meetings is make sure that the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ that has been given to you, the mercy that's been extended to you, the forgiveness, the love, all that attribute of that wonderful personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is the model of how you treat one another and how you're interacting with one another. Make it the model, okay? Now, let's not get into the catch-22 over here, okay? Squabbling siblings or spousal rivalry, there are too many marriage relationships that have ended up in a ditch. The only escape is for someone to lay down his or her life. The man must lay down his life, but not at the expense of abdicating leadership. However, it is the responsibility of the wife to lay down her life and to follow. Listen, dear people, you've got to understand. There are some people that just like they don't have husbands that walk with God. They don't go to church, but the husband's pleased to dwell with the wife. There are a lot of areas you can follow your husband in. Obviously, you can't follow him and walk away from God. You can't stay home from church. You, you, because, you know, the reality of it is, is it's, you, it's better to obey God than man. But there's still a respect and a reverence and a relationship and a friendship that should always exist in that relationship and be modeled before your children if your children are going to be right. Because I've seen some and known of some women that, my goodness, if that is, if that's, if that isn't, if that is an example of the Lord Jesus Christ, no way. And that's all the husband ever gets to see. Fortunately, there's nobody here in that situation here tonight. We don't have any single mothers in here tonight. Maybe some are actually watching on the web. We have some mothers who, whose husbands don't follow the Lord. But the bottom line of it is, by and large, you all have godly men. We aren't a woman. One of the things that make us a unique church is we are not a woman-run church. Most churches are women run. The majority of the participants in the church as churches are women. Most of the husbands stay home. If you take a majority, a landscape of statistics of how many women show up versus men, there's more women than, than there are men. Huh? And, and, and in fact, it becomes a women run church. We've never been that. We've always had a little bit of an, of, of, of an extra population of men. And, and praise God, we've had good, strong leaders and we can, uh, godly leaders, and we can r see God continue to raise up men who maintain that responsibility of righteousness and godliness and, and, and really with every bit of effort in their life, obey God. Look, you, women, you're going to have to give your husband a break. I mean, my goodness, he's growing. He's maturing. 
He's and, and, and so you you have to understand the the supportive role, not the critical role. Oh, you still need to do this. Ah, you still missing it. It's, it's the supportive role. God hadn't called you to be your husband's critic. I didn't say nothing about no executive critic, huh? That just doesn't even. I'm an executive examiner. I'm the auditor. <laughs> I'm here to tell you where the deficits are here. Okay. People, no, 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 no. We can't have, who's going to go first? Guess who gets to go first? The woman. The woman. Praise God for the women. Praise God for the godly women. Praise God for the women who are, serv- uh, who are servants. Someone said, I asked the Lord one time, why is it the women seem by population to be able to receive more uh, than, uh, from God than men? And, and I had a revelation, this man of God said, the Lord showed me that women practice servitude far more than men do. And, they, and as a result, they are more uh, receptive to the Holy Ghost because that is the state that your heart and your life must be in. God's not going to just go with what your mouth says says. He's going to go with what your heart. He's not going to go without your, about what's your outward appearance and outward show of things. He's going to go with the things that you actually do indeed. And you see, the hearer is not justified, but the doer it is, it is one justified. People, you don't think that, you know, it's just you're getting some bad end of the deal because you have to be the servant. Look, both man, both husband and wife have to be servant. The servitude is the kingdom of God way of living. And if the great reward in it is the more you give yourself to serve the better and more receptive you're going to be. Somebody says, why is it that I just don't seem to receive? Because you ain't no servant, man. You, you just aren't a servant. You do not know how to yield. You always pushing and shoving. You always write. Everybody, you're examining what everybody says based upon what you believe. You don't submit to nothing. Huh? God's called you and I to endeavor to keep the unity of the uh, spirit and the bond of peace. It isn't about you evaluating every word that comes out of the preacher's mouth based upon what you believe and checking off whether they right or wrong. Huh? No wonder your wife is critical. Because you're so critical. You don't come under the rule of authority. And then ultimately that has a spiritual repercussion in your wife. You're trying to stand on there screaming at your wife, telling her she needs to submit. Huh? Well, that ain't going to do you any good. And, and she's a gracious woman. She's going to go, yeah, okay. And say, and, 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 and think in her, in her heart, Lord, help him. <laughs> help him to submit. Oh, people, there's a great reward in servitude. <laughs> this, this is the greatest in the kingdom of God. That is the realms. God, the Holy Ghost only functions in the realm of servitude. Can you get that? Holy Ghost only functions in the realm of love. He only functions in the realm of meekness. It's not like you've got to be subverted. Huh? No, 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 no. If you're not careful, what you're going to do is you're going to be caught up in the, the mind and the spirit of disobedience. You're going to be caught up in the mind and the spirit of the world. You're going to be influenced by humanism and the powers of rebellion. And now you're going to try to start uh, uh, understanding what God's called you to do in the framework of the world. And it ain't going to make any sense. Because I'm telling you right now, the world is upside down compared to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is right. The world is wrong. God is wanting you and I to be the beacons, the light, city set up on a hill of what is right so that the world might see what works. Instead of having the same kind of divorce rate in the church as there is in the, in the, in the world. Come on, dear people. There is a remedy. When you walk in the principles of the of redemption, you're going to get God's results. If you're going to lay down your life for your husband, no matter what it is he's doing, I guarantee you that as a redemptive principle showed to us at the cross of Calvary, God will invade that situation and he will make it right. He will change it. He will change your husband to be the man that he's supposed to be. That's redemptive. That's how you and I got changed. Because Jesus laid down his life for us when we were enemies. There was no romance. There was no friendship. There was no affection. We were enemies. We were contrary in our behavior. There was no connection. God commended his love towards us. Huh? And he commands us. He says, you ought to love one another if God so loves you. How much more? Huh? If God laid down his life for you, how much more? If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be a good follower or not? Leaders, you're going to be a good follower? Yeah, you're going to be a good follower if you're going to be a good leader. Mamas, you're never going to be a good leader to your house. You're going to all, you understand the responsibility. Women understand the responsibility. You have more impact on your children than the husband does. Just the way it is. 
the husband must understand that it is his divine responsibility before God to train his house in the word of God, to minister the word of God, not only just preaching the word of God or declaring the word of God or reading the word of God from the Bible, but living it by example that there won't be these destructive things that run ruin in our lives. And then for years, our children literally are tossed to and fro as the spiritual darkness that we allowed to be planted in their hearts and in their lives and in our family wreak havoc, literally, upon their souls. So, as followers, you must lay down your life. What you think, in other words, here, I want to just be practical. Okay, lay down your life. What you think should be done, the way you think it should be done, you have to lay that down. I don't agree. You're going to have to lay it down. Huh? You're going to have to say no to your way and yes to God's way. And husbands, you got the responsibility of making sure that you're going to your reference manual. You're going to the word of God and crying out to the Holy Ghost. And you're, and you're doing it right. And, 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 and as, as best as you understand and know at the point of maturity that you're in and recognize women that they're going to grow and that God's going to make it all right. He'll, he'll set the wrongs right. He'll cause them to mature. He'll take that faithfulness, that sincerity, and that truth, and he will turn it for good in their lives. He'll turn it to good in, in, in the children's lives. It, unless you go fighting against it and create sedition. Huh? God's called you to lay down your life. This is how we perceive the love of God. How am I going to perceive your love? Here's how we understand the love of God. Here's how we identify the love of God. Here's how we see it, in other words. Here's how we get to observe it. Here's how it's going to directly impact us because he laid down his life for us. Then how are we going to, and how are we going to understand how to serve one another in love? We're going to be directly impacted or be able to see and perceive and understand love in action because we watch as we lay down our life for each other. Oh, blessed is the holy name. I'll break the yoke in Jesus' name. Every power of darkness it would try to do otherwise. People, you can't think that you're going to be successful in God and you have some Hollywood star as your model. You're emulating the women's club of America. Huh? You're, you, 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 you pay your annual dues to women's right to riot. You belong to the feminist society? It's just, that's arrogance. It's rebellion. It's, it's, it's anarchy. It's against the rule of God, not the rule of man. Are you listening to me? You foul spirit of darkness, I bind you, you lying thing. Want to create some more dysfunctional kids? Want to ruin another generation? You foul spirit of darkness in Jesus' name, I'll break your power. I'll bind your work. It's about the only way you can deal with it. Because it's a demon spirit. Just a demon spirit. Anything opposed to God's word is a demon spirit. It's a rebellious demon spirit. You got that? You got that, folks? So, listen, I'm going I'm, I'm to read this scripture. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our households. I know it says for the brethren there in 1 John three sixteen. But why do, we, why do we just want to re- read it for the brethren? Why do we want to just read it for the lost and dying world? Huh? Why do so many preachers become so successful in ministers, become so successful in ministry, and their kids are shooting heroin, becoming drug addicts and drunks and just crazy, out of, out of control? Because they don't have the principles down at home. They went after success and ministry. They went after a career more than they went after the family. The priorities were totally wrong. There wasn't a love going on between husband and wife. That's why there's so many divorces. There was much, there wasn't, there wasn't a process of this affection that it has to be first and foremost at home. Show it at home first. Okay? Show it at home first because this is right and pleasing to God. Amen? It, it, and then this is the second point under this is it is not ha- it's not about how your husband loves you. It's about how you love him. Can you get that? And I look, I noticed that I, I left off the M on him. It's not about how he serves you. It's about how you serve him. 
Remember the cautionary note? Huh? Remember the cautionary note? The ways to create sedition and revolt in the house. And then this is really where we got to bring it. We have to bring it. Otherwise, it's to catch 22. You first. I'm not doing nothing. There you do it. And there's, it's just, it, and, and you know what? If the Lord felt that way, and if that was, if that was truth, then none of us, we'd all be without hope. We, none of us would be here tonight. We'd all be in the same situation that the rest of the world is in. Here in his love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's love. It's not about how we loved him. It's about how he loved us. Women understand. I mean, the bottom line of it is, um, there is, there is no way to turn a bad situation around but through love. The Lord Jesus told us the only way to change things. He showed us the only way that things can be changed in the nature of things, in the scheme of things. The only way that, th- that lives can be changed for the good is that someone goes to the cross. Huh? Women, there is a redemptive, redemptive principle in your willingness to walk in love, even for those who may not deserve it. Some of you can underline that. He just don't deserve it. Deserve. Since when did anything become about deserve? Huh? There ain't no, that word doesn't even exist in the, in the manual of love. Deserve don't even exist in the manual. Of, don't even exist. Don't even exist. Yeah, got to get rid of it. Types of servants. Slaves. We're in the next section. Types of servants. Slaves are willing servants. Slaves under the yoke, they have no choice. God's not calling you to be under, not calling you to be a slave. Men, God's not looking for you to be in expectation that your wife is going to be a slave. She's under the yoke. She's taking care of everything. She's down scrubbing the door, scrubbing the floors on her hands and knees, and you're screaming, Where, where's my breakfast? Huh? Because she's been up since 5 o'clock in the morning scrubbing the floors, right? It's not slaves. I want to just make sure that everybody's got a distinction between slaves and servants. Okay, Jesus isn't our slave. He's come to be our servant. He calls because he loves us so much, he'll command all of us to sit down. He's not going to say, well, I can't believe nobody's helping me. I can't believe i got to do it all on my own. He's going to command us all to sit down. He's not going to even allow us, any of us to help. He's going to take his servant's garment and apron, and he's going to serve all of us because that's the ways of the kingdom. He takes, he takes basin and towel in hand, and he says, sit down. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to show you the ways of the kingdom. This is how the anointing works. This is the way the kingdom of God works. This is how you get to function in the realms of my goodness and my glory. So many people want the goodness. So many people want the glory. They want the blessings. They, and, and they should because they've been made available to us and they're the most awesome thing on the, on the planet while you're running around trying to do whatever it is you're doing and missing out on all this good stuff. Huh? The Lord's looking at you and me and he's saying, I want to show you how it all works. And now, if I've done this for you, you need to do it all the more for one another. Husbands, when's the last time you washed your wife's feet? Women, when's the last time you washed your husband's feet? Oh, you know, when I was growing up, it was still a big thing in the church. Foot washing services. Huh? You know, a communion service, Pentecostal churches, foot washing services. Pull them stinky socks off. <laughs> huh? I mean, especially up in the mountains. Uh, you know, up in the hill country. Huh? <laughs> Goodness gracious. Had to have a miracle service just to get past this, the smell of it all. And they have foot, foot washing service. Everybody washes their feet and they still just as angry and still just as mad and still just as cantankerous, still just as much division and strife and backbiting and talking bad about one another and criticizing the latest preacher they saw or heard on the radio. So that ain't the right kind of foot washing. That's not what Jesus was showing us. He was showing us how to serve one another on the lowest, as it were, level. I mean, we're not just talking about a servant. We're just talking about the servant who's, you know, washes the hands of the man of God. (laughs) 
like Elisha was to Elijah. That's where the anointing is inherited. That's where the blessing is found. It isn't going to be some disastrous thing. It's not going to be, oh, man, I've been made this service rigor. It's been a terrible life. This husband of mine, he's had a taskmaster with a whip in his hand day in, day out. No, no, no. You're going to bring the blessings of God into your house far more than you would ever bring the blessings of God in your house through all the food that you cook, through all the clothing that you would maybe sew if you were living in an agrarian society. And you never, none of you women ever sewed a thing probably. Huh? Maybe some of you. Huh? Now, how many of you have ever made a dress? You made a dress? Praise God. I didn't know that they still do that. You sewed that dress. It's far more important than all of those other types of amenities and things that you can bring into your house to make it lovely and nice to be there and wholesome and good. Nothing's going to match the anointing and the glory of a sanctuary that your house becomes because you're willing to take on the life of Jesus Christ, the role of his very own servitude. To you personally, women, you personally, you being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you doing whatever you do in word and deed, you're doing it all to the Lord. You're doing nothing as a man pleaser just to make, just to have a good show of things. It's from the heart to the Lord Jesus. And he, God sees it and he invades your house. Talk about becoming a Proverbs 31 woman in all of the full measure, which goes beyond all that she could do with her discipline and with her persistence and with her ability to do so many things to create wealth in her own house. Oh, to be able to bring the anointing, to be able to bring the blessing of God because you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so because you're following Jesus, you're following your husband, you're showing that servitude. You're showing that right attitude. Oh, dear people, this is the kind of principles that ultimately empower you and me to actually live out the dream life of days of heaven on earth, to live out a life where we give ourselves to making each other happy, and then our kids are well-adjusted. They're not a dysfunctional thing in them. They are strong. They are confident. They are assertive. They're certain. They rise to the highest ranks of society. That's what God wants. He's promised that, to set us up high above all the other nations of the earth, to put that kind of blessing upon us. Now, think about that you've been given the privilege and the opportunity to be able to have that if you're willing to obey the principles of it. So that should be able to offset that temper tantrum. Huh? That should be uh, uh, able to offset that impulse to yield because psychologically and emotionally you haven't really developed past too much past a five-year-old <laughs> in that particular area. Huh? No, I ain't it. not trying to get anybody's dander up here. Okay, I'll give it 10, 10, 10. I mean, but what, at what point do you expect your children to quit throwing a temper tantrum? Two? Well, then maybe it is two-year-old. But, I mean, yeah, two is pushing it. Two is pushing it. But you do, you do really would like, you would like for them to stop at two. You know, don't prophesy terrible twos. I did that. Okay. Fortunately, I didn't really have any terribles twos. Did we have terribles twos? Oh, that's right. See, Anne prophesied terrific twos. Terrific twos. Praise God. There may have been some people who might have taken, uh, you know, odds with her on that. Hey, but it's a wonderful thing. Listen, I'm going to brag on myself a little bit. I'm brag on my family. It's a wonderful thing to be sitting in a restaurant with the kids and, and a person come up a husband and wife come up and say we have we went up and paid for your dinner because we have never seen a family so well adjusted your kids are incredible sit there and goggle you know just goggle eyed right google eyed rather of our kids right baby remember that i mean what a, what a, what a, what a blessing you know, I'm like, wow, okay, good. And I mean, like I'm taking credit for it, but really it was all the Lord. It's just simply because I was walking in divine principles. You know, I'm walking around one day just holding Joshua and he's, he's now about two years old and walk around praying with him according to my custom. I take my kids up and pray with them. It wasn't just Joshua, it was Daniel. It was also Elizabeth and Ruth Anna. But just at the time, it was Joshua and I'm saying, Lord, how did I get so blessed? 
Lord, how am I get to this point? And the Spirit, the Lord, just, just simply told, just talked to me, just said, because you obey me. Just obey me. You'll be blessed all the days of your life. And, of course, you don't have to take that as a subjective statement. You have that over and over again. You read it in the Bible. Everything that the Lord speaks to us by his Spirit out of our innermost being, you can go to the Bible and look it up, too. That's the way it works. Amen. Too many people, too many of God's people have been willing to lay down their lives for others, but never became a reality in their home. I know I've said this, but I just want to repeat it. I want you to see where you can find it. Okay, you guys got to go over this, right? And you got to review it and, and discuss it and talk about it between each other and, and just ask, you know, ask each other, well, how am I doing here? You know, and, uh, and be gracious as you give a review. However, we must learn that our number one priority is what we do at home. And then from there, we reach out to others. The priority is underscored in 1 Timothy 5, 4. Okay. Here's note that I already gave you. Now, I want to close here tonight with this, with this last section. Learning to be good friends. See how much time I got left. Man, where the time just flew by. Sort of like 17 after 8. Where's the, where's the hour going? I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to keep this to an hour because I, I know you guys go wide open. We have a lot of social pressures on us. And uh, you got to make sure you don't come under that yoke. You make sure you don't come under the yoke of social pressures. Look, train your kids to. Don't, you know, don't let your kids drive themselves too, too hard. Okay? You, you teach them to how, how to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their very best, not to be slothful. Huh? But when they've been up, they've been doing their homework, and they've been after it, and it's now midnight. It's time to go to bed. Huh? You trust the Lord for the rest. And then you watch your kids, and you make sure that, amen, if they're driving themselves too much, if, they're, if they just push themselves too hard, there's just, you know, that, that level of self-discipline is taking them beyond what's practical and right. You just bring them down. Watch out that you're not modeling that for them. Huh? Look, the praises of God are more important to you than the praises of men. Say that to me. Well, there's certain things you do to get the praises of God. And it ain't putting him second to everything else. Are you with me? Don't you be so driven to succeed in the realms of men so that you have the approval of men and the praises of men that you leave off. Keeping God first. If you honor God, he's going to honor you. He's going to take you beyond all your efforts, all of your struggles, all of your workload. I tell you, God will make it easy for you. God will give you an enjoyable life. You won't be feeling like Samson with his eyes plucked off, huh? his ears cut, his eyes plucked out, his ear, ear, ears cut off, ears cut off, his hair cut off, going round and round, grinding, <laughs> grinding. I think sometimes people act like they have their ears cut off. I mean, that, that was a divine slip. Because you wonder, is there hearing? Is there the hearing sense? Huh? Let me just wrap this up. Learning to be good friends. Greater love has no man than he lays his life down for his friends. The definition of friends can't be better underscored than Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. What? A friend loveth at all times. Amen. Praise God forevermore. That's got to be the foundation. Not romance. Not hormones. Not all these things. That, you know, we, especially in a licentious society that wants to make sexuality everything. Look, nobody's arguing. Sexuality, God made sexuality and sexuality is good. But that isn't the driving factor behind the relationship. Come on, dear people. There's something more important to that. And, and, and once again, it's that friendship. It's that divine love. Hallelujah. That makes everything else so much better. And so let me just give you some real key things quickly on, on making sure that you're continuing to mentor good friendship. Holding on to and nurturing a close friendship is the foundation to the kind of love and relationship that is godly. Got to have it. Okay. Got to be friends. You want it. You close confidants, close with each other. Huh? If you if you are looking across at your spouse and saying, "How can I be a friend with that joker?" Look, don't, don't, don't or 
she just nothing like me. You look, that's just demonic. You, you, you got too high of opinion of yourself. Huh? Notch that thing down just a little bit. Huh? Notch that thing down just a little bit. Come on now. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I pray in Jesus' name you'll be able to see the truth. Hear the truth. Amen. The attributes of friendship always represent, always respecting each other. I mean, that has to constantly be in your life. Watch out for yourself. Watch out for yourself if you're not showing the proper kind of respect. Recognize that you're violating something. Uh, you're violating friendship. You're violating that which is very essential to the kind of love and, uh, that God has desired to be in your life. Never take each other for granted. There's ways to be able to monitor that. You've heard me say that before. I'm going to say it again. It's, you can't say it too much. There's ways to monitor that. Okay, in your own life. And you need, to, you need to spend some time with each other and sort that out. And really begin to uh, become aware of certain behaviors and attitudes that you have and that you allow. Maybe you don't even recognize. But it's acts of just taking the other person for granted. You know, they're just always there. You know, why really, why is it that, that people don't really appreciate and value something in their life until it's gone? Okay, we need to get some wisdom so we can see it, see it for what it is while we got it, huh? You know, I, I used to encourage Ann. She didn't encourage me, I, and, you know, and of course she was at home. She gave herself. She laid her life down to raise children that would serve the Lord and to be, would be mighty in the kingdom of God. That's what she gave her life for. And I, I, did, I would just remind her, I said, baby, just remember, all this is going to be gone. It's a flash in the pan. It's a flash in the pan. They only got, you're not going to have them for long. I know that everybody, that's when everybody was running around in diapers, you know. Joshua, Daniel, and Elizabeth all running around in diapers. <laughs> Joshua screaming at Daniel, he's not, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> Just remember, it's a flash in the pan. You're going to long for these days. There will come a day where you'll long for these days. Oh, yeah. Why is it that we don't value something and appreciate it like we should? Huh? Because we need, because we're too immature. But if we'll ask God for wisdom, he'll give us wisdom. But we can't be double-minded. We can't. We, we're going to have to be willing to take a hold of it in truth and in faith. And watch what God will do for us. He'll bless us. He'll give us wisdom beyond our years. It's just the way the Lord is. Continually go through the process of befriending. Define the befriending process. That's the befriending process is where you're trying to gain a person's friendship. You're doing things for them beyond the call of duty. You are. You just, I mean, it's like, you know, you're just whatever you can possibly do to uh, gain their approval. Huh? Huh? You know the befriending process? Go define it for yourself. Define it between one another. Define it for yourself really well so that you know you're constantly giving yourself to the befriending process. Because what happens is we, you know, we go through the befriending process. We make a friend. Then all of a sudden we see their weaknesses. We begin to despise them. And then we go on to the next, we go on to the next venture. Huh? Ooh, despising cannot be there. No despising. Despising is an evil. It's an evil you can say you've got all these reasons, justifiable reasons and excuses for it. Don't change the fact it's an evil. It's an evil. It has nothing to do with God. Therefore, I say it has nothing to do with truth. Therefore, I say it has nothing to do with reality. By definition, then, it's a deception. It's a lie. It's an illusion. Only truth and reality exist in God. So don't, don't let us spend our lives and live our lives in an illusion in a deceptive lie, in a dream, God has poured out upon us the spirit of truth that we no longer have to live under the influence of a lie. Let's don't do it. Let's recognize when, we, when it's a process that has infected our thinking and infected our behavior. And let's let it be excised by the spirit of God. Let it be excised by the blood of Jesus Christ. No despising. Uh -uh. When there's a ridicule, when there's a fault finding, when there's a uh-uh, uh-uh, don't go there. Because you just left out of the process of befriending. You left out of the process of, of, of reverencing one another and honoring one another. Amen. I hope everybody's blessed in Jesus' name. You're enriched by the spirit of the living God.
Now, is anybody on the web, is anybody there on the web have any questions you want to ask me right now? <laughs> a flash in the pan, yeah, it is a flash in the pan. It is a flash in the pan. Yes, enjoy it. Hug them lots, kiss them lots. Don't spend too much time on the computer. Huh? Have more supper times together. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Enjoy more breakfasts together. Yep. Okay, vacations, even if it's crawling in a tent, you're going to long for those days. Those will be days that are just to be a memory, a dear memory. Yep. Because all you have to do is crawl in a tent by yourself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> huh? I mean, it's a blessing, dear people. I mean, it's a blessing, you know, when you go through that phase in life where your kids are grown and they have their own families and now it's just you and your spouse. That's wonderful because God begins to take the relationship to a whole new dimension. I'm gone. Ann and I are stepping in into a whole new dimension. You know, we're leaving the, we're leaving behind the little guys, you know, we, and, you know, and we don't have anybody in the, in the house anymore that's under 18 and, and, you know, they all take care of themselves. They're all self-sufficient. You know, we still, you know, try to get them all in the house at a particular time. But they're all really adults. And now we get to go and now we begin to go into a new phase of, of intimacy with one another. And, and, and it's beautiful. It's, it's just a whole nother. It's just always going to another realm of glory. It's going from glory to glory. It's going from another adventure and another discovery and another blessed journey to an, one after another. If, you'll, if you don't bail out on the process, the people who bail out on the process, they never get to experience this. Divorce will never allow you to experience this. You never get to do it. I'm glad I get to look at it here tonight. I don't have to be too cautious because, you know, to hurt someone's feelings because they've been divorced three or four times. <laughs> or even twice. <laughs> Praise God. Forgive me if you have been. God loves you. He's forgiven you. He's wiped it all away. And you go ahead and you pursue God for what you have. Don't go look for another. Don't try to go back to the other. Go on with what you got. Amen. Okay? And do it right this time. Don't mess up. Jesus' name. Remember, you the you the common you the lowest common denominator, if you want to put it that way. You the common denominator between what happened before and what's happening now. So don't blame too much. Don't be too quick to blame somebody else. Okay, draw a line under that. Get out of that real quick. But the bottom line of the way the Lord chose it to be is glory to glory, people. It just keeps getting good. It keeps getting better. If you want to make it good, if you want it to be better, if you want to go God's way, it's all good. Okay. Amen. Hallelujah. Any questions? We're trying to end by 8.30, and I think we have two minutes to take questions. You got one minute. Any burning questions? I'm getting some good text in here. You can text me your questions, too, in the future, by the way. No, I think it's great for them. I think it's great for them. It gives them answers. It helps them to be on point with you. It helps them to understand where you're going. Okay. Look, there, there, are, there, there were times in my own life with my, you know, my family that I, I misbehaved. And I just had to say to my kids, you know, Dad misbehaved. I'm sorry for that. I was wrong. It was wrong behavior. This is not what we are about. This is not what we're doing. This is not what we are called to do. Huh? So b casting vision for your whole family as to what the sanctuary is supposed to look like, what mom and dad's supposed to look like when they're honoring one another and obeying the Lord Jesus and doing what's right. You know, that, that's blessings. them. I'll tell you right now, people think that their kids shouldn't see them kissing. They're mistaken. That's a blessing and a comfort. Just for the kids to see mom and dad hugging one another and kissing one another. They're into that. Huh? They're little. They crawl up and try to get right in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sit there and look at each other. 
Look at each, each of you, you know. Look at dad. As he's kissing. Look at mom. They're, they're all eyes. That's a good thing. It makes them real happy. It's the yells that's a problem. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the silent treatment. That's the problem. No, don't have none of that. Well, amen. Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus for the authority of your word. I thank you, Lord, that you called and purposed these meetings, these sessions. You told me to do it because of God. You wanted to use the, your word and your instructions to break the yoke and to break the affliction. Father, we thank you that you are breaking the yoke and you are breaking the afflictions that have bound families, that have messed up things from being uh, as you have purposed and called them to be. So, Father, we thank you for the angel of the Lord that surrounds us. We thank you for your fire that is around about us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that is upon our households and upon our family so that the death angel, so the powers of darkness cannot come and kill and steal and destroy from us. Father, we thank you that you are there for us to uphold us, to protect us, to keep us, and to make our way perfect and we thank you father that you are in the midst of us in the midst of our families ordering everything as it's supposed to be according to your will and your divine plan we give you the praise for it in jesus mighty name thank you living god hallelujah say paratai amen lay hands on one another pray for one another comfort one another i was so blessed today i was driving back from my mother's birthday and my wife she scooted over by me and we were driving the truck and she put her arm around me and she said i'm so blessed by my friend huh come on now I'm telling you right now i was driving i was riding high <laughs> blessed is the name of the lord we love you guys pray for pray for one another pray for the families in this church there's many families in this church that aren't even represented here tonight. They, just, they can't come. But many of them, some of them are watching on the web. I pray all of them are. Let's just pray for the families. In Jesus' name.